thank you so much for doing this. And uh, can you give us a little introduction about you? Well, I played uh, Major League Baseball for uh, seven years, and then I went into youth sports coaching uh, for the over 30 years now. I had my own academy, and then uh, currently I just work with students, uh, baseball and softball students. And once again, I've done that for uh, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you uh, start as a baseball player? Like, was this something like, you? was that your dream to play in the majors? Or were you, it was just one of those things you kind of fell into? No, it was my dream, yeah. From the time I was about six, I would say, and just kept working at it. And uh, yeah, I liked all sports, obviously, but baseball was the one that best suited me and the one, you know, I kept pursuing. And so I just, you know, went up the ranks and, played into college and then from there was drafted and you know I got lucky and everything fell together. That's so cool. Uh, so when you were when you were starting as a youth player, what was the what were the steps, if you will, uh, that you had to kind of go through to make it to the pros? Well, you know, you have to obviously keep improving, but I played the usual, like back then it was Little League and then Pony League and then high school ball. And after high school, I didn't really have anywhere to go. I didn't have really any college offers. So I just went to a a school that um, I had visited in the summer once. And so I went to Murray State University and tried out for the team and, and made it. And then... Uh, I just kept getting better, you know, just working hard and got better. And next thing you know, I was playing summer collegiate leagues and then I got drafted out of college, you know. So, um, you know, the normal path, I guessed up. It's just I wasn't highly touted when I was younger and I just kept improving. So what you're saying is so important for me because I think that so many parents, maybe always, I don't know, but at least today, uh, it's almost like the getting better part, they want to skip all together. It's almost like you pick up a ball today and tomorrow you're in the Hall of Fame. And it's just like, okay, but you still need to, the day-to-day -day struggles, the day-to-day -day workouts, the day-to-day -day journey. Um, when you have, when you talk to parents, what do you tell them about that? Because that's so important for any sport, not just baseball. Yeah, you know, everything's a process, and I, I think it's how we define things, you know, that gets us in trouble, because everybody looks at success as, you know, being the best player now, and, you know, having to be the all-star and playing the top teams and things like that, when really the goal should be just improvement and getting you know getting the most out of your own talent so we have to define success as you know preparing to a level that the player is comfortable preparing to and then also um you know getting the effort uh out of them you know and uh, them putting in the the right amount of effort and so that's what success is is preparing and doing your best you know and it's not about being the best. Um, I've seen so many kids that were the best at, you know, 10, 11, 12. And by high school age, they weren't even playing anymore, you know, because people had passed them by uh, for what, like you said, they jumped over those steps of working hard and things like that. And, you know, when everybody gets to be about the same size in high school and uh, people catch up to them, then things change a great deal. And if you didn't have the right work ethic or the right, uh, you know, goal, then, you know, you get passed by. So when you started, uh, did you always know you wanted to play in the, did you want to be a pitcher? Did you want to be an outfielder? Did you have a position that you wanted? Or it's kind of like you found one that worked for you? Well, yeah, I kind of fell into, uh, second base because my arm was so bad when I was uh I had I had a good arm up until about 13 14 and then kind of what we're talking about I I overused it and my arm kind of went dead and it never recovered so I was kind of relegated to second base uh when the Dodgers drafted me they told me I was the first 
player they ever drafted that played second base to be a second baseman. You know, usually they convert <laughs> They usually convert guys from other positions because they have strong arms, and then they move them to second base, you know. But, but I mean, I was a high, I was a second base high school second baseman even in high school. That's how bad my arm was. So, um, I really had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you say overuse, why do you think do you, do you overuse it? Like, were you just playing a lot, or were you pitching, or what was? Yeah, I, I was pitching, and back in the day, you know, we never did anything to let your arm recover you know and it's kind of a funny story but i when i was uh i think 14 maybe 13 but i struck out 20 out of 21 players one game and you know where i grew up baseball was very good and uh and then the next game i struck out 15 out of 21 players and then i never really pitched again because once again after those outings my arm went dead so I can only imagine I threw too much, was throwing curveballs, of course, and, you know, things that maybe weren't healthy. But, you know, back then, you know, coaches and myself, we never knew any better, and you just played. And But I'm sure I probably threw a ton of pitches in order to uh, accomplish that. And then, once again, my arm was never strong thereafter. And I would imagine that that is something that you do mention to your kids or to your parents or the parents of your students when you talk to them, because I know there's a lot of parents who think that, oh, we need to have, my kid has to have pitching lessons and they have to have batting practices. They have to have throwing this and doing that, all this extra stuff besides playing games. Uh, what is usually the responses when you tell parents those kind of things? Well, uh, you know, times have changed. I think there's uh, so many more, uh, so much more knowledge about pitching out there. So hopefully they're getting with coaches that know their stuff, you know, which means they understand how much kids should be throwing and um, how much rest they need and how many months out of the year they should be throwing. So if they get the right coaches, it really shouldn't be a problem because just like anything, you have to develop your skills, you know, and you have to develop an arm to uh, get the strength necessary to keep advancing. But once again, there has to be reason with it and not just going out there without any parameters at all as to, you know, how much and how often. Yes, and how how is it? And like, you know, what are the things that, you know, I coach soccer, for example, and one of the things that I always try to see in the kids that we work with is like this, they have to have like a love for it and like are they there for the right reasons right uh, and a lot of times we, it's it, most of the a lot of these kids let's say even maybe half of them uh if not more are not there for the right reasons because it's like parents it's their culture it's the whatever it is right so how do we make people fall in love with baseball at a young age, uh, is it by maybe watching more games or just go out and play catch with dad or brothers, friends? What can we do? Yeah, I think it's all of those things. And, you know, if you're, you know, I mean, we obviously don't want to make decisions for kids or push them too much into something, but it really needs to happen at a young age, you know, where you, steer them in that direction by, like you say, doing the things you said, you know. Um, my grandson just to, turned two years old and, you know, I got a batting tee in the backyard and, you know, we go out there and I don't have him, I don't tell him what to do, but I show him what I do, you know, and then those are things you hope that he, you know, picks up a little bit. Yep. So, you know, you can't, start young enough in my mind but once again i'm not pushing them to do things i'm showing them you know and then like you say going to games and um watching it on tv and getting excited about it and having enthusiasm for things and when they get it in their blood then i, I think when they start to play it they're going to enjoy it a lot more so um yeah you know that's that's not an easy no, we, no easy answer to that, but I think a lot of people wait till kids are eight years old and expect them to go out and, you know, hustle and be great in baseball when they haven't really had that experience or background before. And then, 
you know, baseball can be boring to kids, you know, and so if, if they don't have a, a liking to it by the time they're that age, it's probably too late. Do you think uh, one of the things I know a lot of people talk about is like the trendy thing of the day is like, do we have kids play one sport or we kids should be playing all sports uh, wow. or as many as possible to develop at a younger age? We're not talking about 25, but what do you think about what's your view on the Well, I, I think the research, I think the research studies show that specialization is not the way to go for young kids. You know, anybody under probably 13 maybe shouldn't be specializing, but um, once again, everything has to be done within reason. You know, uh, I get a lot of kids that they only like baseball, you know, and they don't want to play other sports when they're 10 years old. So, you know, I'm not going to force them into other sports just because specialization, specialization is bad, but I'm not going to have them play more than six months out of the year either. I'm not going to make it a year round thing, you know, and I'm going to uh, make sure they're involved in other activities. You know, there's so many other good things out there they can be doing, you know, besides just sports, you know, and finding other activities that they can enjoy. So it doesn't have to be all about, you know, playing three, four sports, you know, um, but it has to be done within reason where there, there, there are time limits, you know, we're not over scheduling them. I get so, I get so many kids that come to me and they're exhausted because they just come from a basketball tournament or they just, you know, had been doing things all day and then they're coming and you expect them to work hard for uh, a lesson, you know, of, and it's just, you know, it's not, not fair there. to the kids. So, so we, yeah, so we really have to just um, understand specialization is bad, but, um, you know, do things once again within reason. Yeah, I think that uh, I like what you said because it's kind of what we're trying to do with the film is that there is no one size fits all solution to anything. I mean, it's not like, oh, if you do this, boom, perfect. All you sports, it's fixed for good. We'll never have a problem again. I wish, uh, but we know that's not the case. And so many times I find that people are so black and white. Like we kind of forget that uh, specializing in one sport doesn't mean that your child is not doing something else. And as, and I, for what I can see, that as long as your kids are doing other things besides the one or two sports, that's still okay because they are doing other things and they are developing their bodies and minds in different ways. Well, exactly. And just letting them be kids, you know, I mean, just getting out and being with friends and that to me is as important as playing, you know, three or four sports. So, um, you know, and once again, we have to make sure that we're not making their life seem like, you know, they are what they do in sports, you know, and that's where we get into trouble that our lives, our parents, as parents, our life revolves around our kids' game that night, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that that shouldn't be the case, you know, and somewhere along the line, we got to the situation where parents had to be at every game, you know, that's being a good parent, and to me, you know, I, I miss games with my kids, and that was great, you know, we talked about it later, but I didn't want to make it seem so important to them that the pressure builds were, you know, everything is revolving around that night's game and our kids in sports, you know. And so once again, that's the perspective that we've gotten into that is is not always healthy. Yes, and that's, that's huge. Because I, when I was growing up, and some days it feels like it was so long ago, <laughs> it was um, my parents never came to see me almost ever. and they, you know, when I got home, they're like, hey, how did the game go? You guys have fun. You did whatever. I'm like, yeah. And you tell them everything that happened or, you know, most of the times I would get hurt. So they would have to take me to the doctor. <laughs> but that was it. There was no, I mean, I wasn't upset that they weren't coming. But now it's like, if right. there, you know. and then the other parents are starting to say, oh, where is so-and-so? Why are they not here? It's like, okay, well, maybe they had something else to do. 
Right, right. And every, every parent's different, like we were talking about before. Every There's no one situation fits all. You know, if you coach your own child and you're there a lot, that's fine too. But once again, you can't make everything about the sport. You know, you have to keep it within uh, the right perspective that, you know, this is just something we do together and I enjoy watching you play and that's great. But it's, you know, it doesn't, it shouldn't define who they are or how they play in the game, you know. And you just touched on something very important for me because I think that one of the many mistakes that parents can make, not all of them, but they can make, is treating their child as a baseball player or a soccer player or a football player, not as a child. So what can we do to teach parents to, you know, athletes are people. They have, hopefully, other hobbies, other interests, whatever it is, right? We have to be uh, a full person to make it anything, for, let alone an athletic endeavor. So what can we do to help parents understand that concept? <laughs> well, that, that's about 10 movies, the answer to that question right there. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no simple answer. The, the big industry that sports is now, I mean, it's, there's not just one answer. My, my, I think the best avenue is to educate the, the coaches better, you know, because I've seen how I can help parents, not just kids, I can help parents have a better perspective with their kids, you know, the way I work with them. And so I feel like if we can get coaches, um, educate the educators in a sense better, then um, we can reach parents, you know, because I've seen it happen, you know, so many, like we're talking about overbearing parents, I've seen them change because they've seen how I worked with their kids and how their kids react to me and I'm able to get more out of them than they are able to with their push, 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 you know, and, and they come around and, and so many of them thank me later and just saying, you know, you, you kind of helped my relationship with my son or daughter, you know, and so that makes me feel better than helping a player get better in a sense, you know, but, but once again, uh, if we can get through to, at least coaches, you know, every coach affects a lot of different uh, kids and teams over the years. So that that's a good start, but uh, that's not easy either. You know, the, the coaches, a lot of them, you know, I, I wrote a book about coaching and I, I told everybody it will never sell because coaches all feel like they have all the answers already, you know, so it, it, it's not an easy thing. Once again, we, that, that's a long discussion that we could have some time about how we can help parents, you know, so. Well, and that kind of goes to another thing, that, another topic that we're talking a lot about in this film is how coach, a lot of coaches, and I've noticing more and more uh, with other sports, how it's seeming similar. I mean, there's always some variation, but it's the general idea Coaches don't like to share information at this age, you know, that you, not in the pros, I don't know about the pros, but at this age, high school and below, they don't like to share. And it's seeming like they know everything and very few, they say they want to learn, they say they want to do better, but they never do. Because they, they kind of get caught into the cycle of, I want a game, so I must know everything. Uh, oh, exactly. You hit it right on the head there, you know, they... Yeah, they just feel like they know everything. And unfortunately, a lot of them coach the way they were coached, you know. But, you know, things things that worked 15, 20 years ago, they, they're they not the same things that work with kids today. So they're using those same old methods that don't work and don't reach kids. And then, you know, we have a problem and then everything just perpetuates each year or each generation where, you know, they teach the way – they were taught and it's that hard nosed tough guy type coach. But once again, those things, you know, they're, they're not uh, what I don't feel they work anymore, but they're, they're out there, you know, so. Yeah. And especially in a, I mean, every sport you need to make adjustments in whatever the field, whatever the sport you're doing, you have to make adjustments. You can't just do the same thing over and over. Um, 
But in one of the baseball is definitely one of the trickiest for that kind of thing because of how people pitch to you or how you have to swing the bat or, you know, runners on first and third or whatever the situation is. There's so many variables and you have to adjust your head, your positioning, et cetera. And when you see it on TV and the commentators are always talking about how wonderful such and such player is making adjustments or such and such coach is figuring out how to do different things in different situations, right? And they're all being praised for that, as they should. Uh, and yet, at the youth level, we don't see that. Yeah, you know, uh, I always tell everybody that it's, you know, it's, it's never as easy as it looks, uh, that, that's for sure. And, you know, people, coaches forget how tough it was for them, you know, and, uh, you know, they just think that because they tell a kid, here's what you do, that they're going to automatically be able to go out there and do it, you know, and it's obviously every sport is so much harder than that. So, um, yeah, you know, that's where a lot of coaches lose perspective too. And, uh, but, you know, we don't train coaches very well, if at all, and anybody can coach. And, you know, I always tell everybody, you know, would we ever send our kids to school if the teachers didn't have training, you know, and yet we do it nonstop in sports, you know, we send, send them with coaches that have no training at all or very little and, just because they're running a travel team, you you know, they have that word travel or, co or club team associated with them. That means, oh, they must be an expert, you know, and, and really it just means they wanted to coach a team, you know, or, they, you know, they were tired of someone else coaching their own kid, you know, and yet, once again, they don't have any training. And so we, we don't get anywhere. <laughs> Is there a life? Do you have to get a license for, for coaching baseball? Uh, no, there's a few. Yeah, there's certification classes out there, and there might be some leagues. I think the leagues try to tell you know coaches to take these classes and that, but I mean, I think they're pretty much just blow away things. And and uh, yeah, I'm not really sure, but not that I know of. If you start a travel team, you know, you can do whatever you want, basically. That's not good. <laughs> what do you think no, of travel no, ball? No. Yeah. What do you think of travel ball? Well, it, it's, an, it's, yeah, it's kind of inevitable now that we have to have it. And, you know, I don't think we're going back to the days of just community play. So... Once again, I you know, it's fine. They like the competition of it, and I understand that. Um, but there's a lot that could be so much better, you know. So once again, that's a whole nother discussion and uh, something that would take a lot to uh, uh, solve the issues involved with it. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a shame how much money it costs to play and uh, – you know, it's excluding a lot of people in our society from playing because they can't afford it. So there's a lot of issues with when you start thinking of travel and the money involved and you have more than one kid in a family. And, you know, I always, I always tell everybody I was part of the problem of the way things have become because, you know, about 30 years ago, I started charging people for my expertise, you know, well, you know, the minute they pay for something, they expect so much more from their kids. And, and once, you know, once you expect more, the pressures build everywhere, you know, the pressures on the coaches, the pressures on the players. So, so, you know, I'm not innocent in all this. And I, I feel bad about that, you know, so I was just trying to help people and make a living. But, you know, once money got involved, things, things change. But that's, I think that is a, a huge part of the problem is that there are a lot of coaches, uh, not just you, who are making a living off of coaching because that's their passion, that's their whatever. Uh, hopefully it's their passion. Uh, so, of course, you have to balance making a living versus developing kids properly. 
Oh, for sure. You know, and that's what it's all about. You know, I think the the ones that have made a living with it, hopefully, I mean, because they've been able to make a living, they must be teaching the right things, developing people and players the right way, you know. So there's so much more to it than just, uh, you know, the sports and skill part of it. I think they're they're learning a lot of, you know, uh, lessons about the game and about life along the way. So, you know, I think there's a lot of value in that. But once again, it does bring in pressure on kids to do so much better because their parents are paying so much more for that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's hard. It's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy thing. Yeah, one of the things that I think a lot of more studies are coming out on the importance I mean, we kind of always anecdotally know that, uh, but for kids uh, to rest, to not play five games in a weekend, to not practice 27 times in three days, to just spend maybe a month or two, not play during the summer, just let go, just be whatever, go climb a tree or something. Um, what are we doing are we doing something, are things better about that? Do you think people are understanding that rest is huge more or do you think it's just no different and things are just as bad? Yeah, I don't think there's enough. Uh, I, I don't think it's better because, you know, once, once your competitor team is practicing nine or 10 or 11 or 12 months out of the year, then the parents see that and then they pressure the coach into saying, well, if they're doing it, my kids needs to be playing just as much. And so then once again, the year round cycle begins. And, you know, even though they might get a few weeks here off and there for Christmas or whatever, it's still overbearing, you know. So um, I, I don't see it as better in my area. There, It might be some places, but yeah, we really should have uh, more guidance on how many months out of the year kids should be playing and based on their age and things like that you know so um yeah i don't i don't think it's better no I, yeah i was asking because of the you know and i can only say anecdotally because i do not coach and my kids do not play baseball at the moment uh who knows next year or two years from now but uh from what colleagues and friends say you know the baseball year is their all year Man, it's like if you don't play it all year, it's like might as well not play. That's how the attitude is. Uh, because you know, being living in Las Vegas, uh, for the most part, nine, ten months out of the year, the weather is great. Uh, even if it's not super hot, it's 90% of the time sunny. Uh, that puts an incredible amount of pressure on kids, but also on parents, because I don't believe that every single parent out there is trying to mess up their kids. Yeah, agreed. And once again, you know, it's kind of that, you know, we talk about that and then we talk about, you know, not specializing, but, you know, if they don't specialize, then they're, they're running from sport to sport to sport. And then we're wearing them out in that way too. You know, they're overscheduled so much. And uh, so, you know, we, it, it's a, it's a cycle we have to try to get out of, I guess, but you know, we want them to play more sports and the parents that understand that do that. And yet their team is practicing along at the same time. So it, it it's, it's, you know, they got a lot of things they have to try to uh, balance out. Well, one of the things that I noticed uh, recently, actually, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, um, forgive me, I can't be as more accurate. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was within the last, two weeks. One of the big uh, soccer clubs in Europe, uh, in Germany, uh, decided to cancel anything uh, U10 or U9 and below. So in their club, which is a professional club that has U5, 6, 7, whatever, um, they no longer offer anything for 10-year-olds and below. They've canceled them all. And Apparently, they started to do that because in the country, they start talking about doing that, too. Uh, I heard also in Italy, they're starting to consider doing that, where to get rid of professional academies, so to speak, 
for the less, you know, 10 and below. Uh, do you think that that is something that in the U.S. it can be done or should be done, or is this something to consider? Um, I don't see it being done here. You know, it's just too competitive. But once again, we should have better uh, guidelines for when, you know, we should, uh, you know, let kids get involved with travel type organizations. You know, I mean, there's national rankings now for nine and 10 year old teams, you know, and it's like, you know, what is that, you know? And so we're, we're, we're heading in, uh, we're heading in the opposite direction, unfortunately, you know, but, you know, I always said, we really, we really need a, a ministry of youth sports at the highest yeah. level, you know, mm -hmm. that would start, putting out information on all this research that's being done because, you know, you and me might know things, but it's not getting out to other people. And so we have to have a way of getting this information out to parents. Cause like you said, a lot of parents, uh, they would like to do the right thing by their kid, but, but they don't know what that is if they don't have the information and same with coaches, you know, so we should have a, someone that's putting out, information that people have to read and get to and uh, make decisions on um, you know there's a lot of smart people out there running a lot of these you know youth uh, things that help youth you know and uh, you know like Dr. Rob Bell like I noticed on your site I mean those yeah. guys are very they're very sharp and they could be making decisions that are, are important for our kids but you know, we're not getting that information to them. So once again, it's a, it'd be a huge project to turn things around, but it has to come sooner or later. Yeah. And that's kind of like our focus is exactly, it's a lot of like what Dr. Rob Bell says uh, and what you have been saying, what we've been talking about. It's all about, it has to start from the kid and it has to, the kid has to make decisions. Uh, like perfect example, I had a kid I was coaching uh, for soccer and he also played baseball at the same time. Uh, and so he would come, like you said earlier, from baseball practice, like it was a two hour practice. Then he would come to soccer practice and the kid was fried. And then on Saturdays when we play games, the kid will either before our game or after our game, he would have a baseball game as well. Uh, and the poor kid was completely kaput. And at the end of the season, you know, November, December, I asked the father, I said, hey, you know, you guys coming back next season, which in uh, Las Vegas, it starts back again in March for soccer. So you pretty much have about three months where you could theoretically do nothing or something else. It doesn't happen, but in theory, you could do that. Um, and the father told me, well, I haven't decided what I want to do for my son. And I just couldn't believe it. I asked him, well, what does he want to do? And he looked at me like I was diseased. I had like the bubonic <laughs> plague or something. It's like, I, he told me, I decide what he does. I know what's best. You know, one of those, I forget the exact quote, but it was one of those. And, and I was just like staring at the guy like, you know, like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, and he was serious. Like, no, I have to decide. And it's just like, I don't, we need to focus on the kids because they are the ones, it's their lives. Well, for sure. It's, you know, we, we have to have a kid first attitude for sure. And we have to let them have a voice, you know, and that's, that's part of the equation, you know, and like I always say, I mean, I, I uh, if we can get the coaches to have the right philosophy and the right methods of teaching, I think we can get that message to the parents and then uh, things can start to change, you know. So, um, yeah, it, it's definitely the kids should have a voice and a lot of times they don't. Yeah, one of the things that always uh, fascinated to me was, you know, when you hear about the great managers, in the professional world, whether it's Joe Torre or Cox or Tommy Lasorda, you know, whatever, pick one. And you have most of the times when you hear people praising great coaches, it's always the same. They listen to me, they paid attention to me, 
they helped me, they pushed me when I needed, you know, they said all those the things that you, ex- you know, you expect a manager to do. And yet, at the kid level, at the youth level, I always find it if, you know, I've been told because I, I'm not a yeller, and I had parents and other coaches tell me, well, why didn't you coach? Why are you not coaching? And I'm like, I am. I'm just not yelling. And how is it that, you know, you have like this whole thing, you know, in the pros, we revere the coaches who change, who make adjustments, who are open to talk to kids. And I mean, not well, some kids and obviously more uh, veteran players in a different way, with different tacks, with, you know, whatever it is. And yet at the kid level, it has to be like a one size fits all. I'm going to yell at you, scream at you, torture you. And then I'm expecting that you're going to turn into my trap. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing. Yeah, parents don't understand. You'll get all kinds of parents, you know, some want to push, push, push their kid and want you to do it. And then there's the other side where if you say one, you know, harsh thing, then the parents all over you, you know. So there, there's all kinds of parents too that, you know, want you to be, you know, everything to everybody, and that's never going to happen, you know. And I tell coaches right away, you're never going to please everybody, but you have to be yourself, you know, and you have to teach the way you think is right as long as it's, um, you know, with patience and understanding. And like you said, keeping the kids in mind first, you know, that always has to be the first a coach's first thought is, you know, what's best for the kids, you know, not, not what's best for me or not what's best for the parents, but what's best for the kids, you know? And um, so, yeah, there's no one way is best, but there's some parents that, you know, expect you to be everything to everybody. So one of the things that you always hear coaches say, especially at the youth level, but I'm sure it happens in the pros is, well, that kid is not, tough enough right so one of the things i'm assuming i mean it's i guess it's genetic for anybody to turn out to be mike trout you know mike trout is genetically brilliant uh obviously oh, or you know whatever pick a pitcher today you know kershaw or something you know they're they have something that makes them at an elite level that is incredible um what can we do as parents to help kids get better or help you know put them in a position where getting better is a good thing or you know what i mean like how can we help them not be so stressed out and they can work on their things uh and do you think also second part of the question do you think there is something that can be taught and something that cannot be taught well i think first of all you have to you know, youth youth coaches have to focus on the fundamentals and the basics, you know. Um, I've seen a lot of kids become mentally tough the minute they could do something better, you know. I mean, if you have a better swing and you can follow balls off instead of swing and missing, well, you, be, you look like you're mentally tough because you can battle the pitcher, you know. So, oh, he's yeah. tough, you know. Whereas, you, so, I mean, at first, you have to focus on fundamentals and then knowledge, you know, to me, uh, if someone knows how to do something, if a kid knows how to do it, whether they can do it or not, knowledge gives them mental toughness, you know, because they know how to do it and they can tell themselves, okay, this is what I need to do. And then their frustration level goes down so much more. But if you don't know how to do something, the understanding of it, you know, frustration is normal, you know, and one of the biggest things I see in kids nowadays compared to years ago is they, they get down on themselves so easily, you know, the minute something goes wrong, they fall apart, you know, and like we're talking about, they're not mentally tough. Well, they don't know what to do. So they have to learn, hey, here's what I do, you know, and then Here's what I can do myself personally to make the change. Now, once again, it may not happen, but just the knowledge of uh, what to do and understanding the basics, you know, uh, takes a lot of their frustration away. And then instead of beating themselves up, they just say to themselves, okay, I didn't do it. 
but at least I knew how to do it, you know. So, you know, learning how to do things, why we do them, and a, an adjustment they can make, you know. And I always tell, you know, coach, uh, players need to learn their strengths and they need to learn their weaknesses. And so I always say, you know, you, you practice your weaknesses, but you play to your strengths, you know. So once you know what you do well in a game, those are the things that, you know, you need to do. But, you know, you keep practicing your weakness, but that's in practice, you know. So, so once again, that's a, you know, that's a tough question. And uh, mental, mental toughness isn't something I can just give anybody. I can't just give them confidence, you know. But, but I, I try to make players, you know, optimistic that they can do things and also uh, give them knowledge. You know, to me, knowledge is so important for uh, – keeping their frustrations and anxiety down, you know. So, you know, I see parents working with kids all the time and the kid gets so upset so quick, but, you know, no one tells them what to do correctly. So, you know, I get frustrated too if I don't know what how to do something or why I do it that way. So, tough question. <laughs> no, but that's, I think that's so important because I, that is, part of the problem that we don't talk to the kids the way that that particular kid needs to hear things we just talk the way i you think i should say it without trying to understand okay but did he or did she actually hear and understand what my words meant well for sure and you know that it it, it gets back to training of our coaches and our parents you know to have better training for them so they know how to do those things you know it, you know it, if someone's working all day you know they're uh you know a lawyer or accountant or whatever to expect them to go out there and be a great coach like you know Phil Jackson or something well you know it, that's unreasonable you know and I mean I, I've been doing it over 30 years and I still learn every day how to work with kids and better ways to go about things so you know i we can't expect without training people we can't expect them to know how to just automatically go out there and be great with kids or you know understand the game and um, understand what's going wrong so we we have to do a much better job of training people uh in some way so one more question so if you had you know, you could do whatever you wanted. You can, you know, easy the perfect world. How would you set up a program for kids? Um, you mean nationwide or personally, or you mean with a small Either group like, or a big what, group? What do you? Well, what would what do you think we should be doing as a well as a nation actually? Because we are talking in a nation yeah. type of thing. Well, do you think that we could do a you know a regional thing or a national thing what what would you do like what would you be a, what would your dream scenario i would say nationally like i said maybe have a ministry of youth sports have the experts cover each age group you know so here's an expert that is good at teaching five and six year olds and then here's an expert at seven or eight and then you know, we have a national database where if you're going to coach, they have to sign up through this, you know, and then that would also help with background checks, obviously. But we would have them, they have to, if they're going to coach a team in our country, they have to sign up to this. And then we can give them, you know, through their emails, we can be sending them information. And then, you know, if you really want to make it perfect, you know, they have to get certified by passing answering certain questions of how you do things you know and have ongoing training you know of them during the season and obviously people don't have tons of time where but we can make it quick and short you know and uh and pair and uh coaches it should be mandatory that coaches have meetings with their parents at the beginning of the season to talk about all this stuff we've been talking about you know, but also they should have ongoing meetings with parents occasionally to get together, together, review how things are going, 
you know, instead of having parents sniping on the internet or behind the coach's back and in the stands, you know, it should be all out front where we meet with co parents, you know, and coaches got to be willing to listen to suggestions and, but they also have to be willing or have an avenue where they can talk to parents to explain why they're doing what they're doing too, you know, and if we got communication going so much better, we could solve so much. And then, you know, things are going to filter down to where the kids have a much better, uh, you know, environment for learning and developing, you know. So, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I think we should have classes for at least athletes in high school, at least, where they take coaching uh, and parenting classes, you know, where they they learn at a young age, you know. I mean, players just learn the way their coaches teach them. Oh, that must be the right way to do things, right? But maybe it's not, you know. So if we have, you know, coach books for them where, you know, studies show this is the best way to do things, then kids learn that. And then someday when there are coaches, they're going to be better prepared. So, you know, there's, there's so many things we could be doing probably won't be done but you know all we can do is you know maybe your film will make all the difference Joe. <laughs> I'm hoping that it can make a little bit of a change because all we need is a little uh you don't have to change everything in one shot but if we can slowly make changes uh from the bottom up that's what I think, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that's why I believe that we can really make lasting changes. Because if the parents and the children, and especially the children, scream for it, eventually the top will hear it. That's my hope. Well, yeah, I just, you know, like we said before, I don't think kids get enough of a voice. And so I don't know if they can be the ones screaming. So it has to start with the adults, obviously. And go from there. Yeah. Hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, we hope that at least with this movie, we can show that kids need to have more of a voice or even a voice. Uh, because yeah, it's, yeah. It's too I think important. That's it. It's way too important. So um, thank you so much, Jack, for doing this. Um, I really appreciate your time. Uh, definitely looking forward to see you in person uh, when we can, uh, when we can travel again. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, be safe out there and, uh, Thank you. Yeah, same to you, Joel. Best of luck.